Good morning, everybody. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Eugenia Cheng, who will deliver the Erdős Lecture for Students at this JMM. Eugenia Cheng is a mathematician and a concert pianist. She is scientist in residence at the School of Art Institute, in, uh, School of Art Institute of Chicago and won tenure at the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. She previously taught at the universities of Cambridge, Chicago, and Nice, and holds a PhD in pure mathematics from the University of Cambridge. Alongside her research in category theory and undergraduate teaching, her aim is to rid the world of math phobia. Eugenia was an early pioneer of math on YouTube, and her videos have been viewed over 15 million times to date. She has also assisted with mathematics in elementary, middle, and high schools for over 20 years. Her first popular math book, How to Bake Pie, was featured on The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, and Beyond Infinity was, featured on, uh, was, uh, was shortlisted for the Royal Society Book Prize in 2017. She also writes the Everyday Math Column for the Wall Street Journal and has completed mathematical art commissions at Hotel EMC2, 6018 North, the Lubezhnik Center, and the Cultural Center in Chicago. Eugenia also composes art song and was commissioned by Grammy-nominated soprano Laura Strickling for her 40 at 40 project and by Lynx Project for their 2022-23 Amplify series. She is founder of the Liederstube, an intimate oasis for art song based in Chicago. Recent writings include The Art of Logic and Illogical World, X plus Y, A Mathematician's Manifesto for Rethinking Gender, as well as two children's books Molly and the Mathematical Mystery, and Bake Infinite Pie with X equals Y. Her latest book, The Joy of Abstraction, was released in October 2022. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to be here. And first of all, I would like to thank the AMS and the organizers of this giant conference for inviting me to give the Erdős Lecture for students. I am very honored to be giving this lecture. Also, I have an Erdős number of two, so I feel quite proud of that. Uh, there's a link here where you can download the slides and follow along on your own device in case that would help you. I find that helps me a lot when I'm at a slide talk. The preprint for this research is also at that link. And also, I would encourage you, as this is a lecture for students, I would especially encourage students to think about any questions you might like to ask, because I will particularly encourage students to ask questions at the end of the talk. And also, I've heard from several people, many people actually, that one thing they miss from Zoom talks, most of which I don't miss at all, but one thing people have said they miss is the ability to have a little chat open, to chat to your friends, to help you understand what's going on. And so if you feel like it, please do open some kind of chat if you have friends here and chat with them to help you understand what's going on. I encourage all use of devices to help you understand in any way that will help you. I would like to talk about commutativity, associativity, and units, and how I think of that as being a higher dimensional ballet in the push and pull that they have with each other and the way that to find this elegant flow, there needs to be a balance and also some strength at the root of what's going on. So here is the plan for this talk. First, I will talk about some equations, hopefully equations that we're all very familiar with, and then there'll be three things that come out of those equations. The idea of equations only holding weakly up to isomorphism, how we use higher dimensions in category theory to deal with that, and how those three forms of equation are interconnected in ways that may not immediately seem obvious at first sight. I'll then bring all those things together in the way that I most love bringing things together, which is using category theory. And I will not assume that you already know what category theory is, so there will be a rapid introduction to category theory, followed by immediately a launch into the higher dimensional ballet that I would like to tell you about. So equations. I would like to start with an equation I think we all know, and I know it's a minefield to begin a talk by saying, here's something we all know. And I distinctly remember a talk I went to as a grad student which began, well, let's just start with a call by value, simply type lambda calculus. And I thought, well, that's me gone from this talk. But I hope 
that we actually do all know this equation since it's the associativity of addition. And this is a basic equation that we think of as being very basic math. But I'd like to show that there's a, a great deal more profundity to these equations, also the commutativity of addition and the idea of units for addition, which we take for, sort of for granted when we're talking about numbers anyway. But as I'm sure many of you are fully aware, things get much more profound when we're talking about more subtle mathematical objects or indeed things in life which do not work as straightforwardly as numbers do. For example, if you want to make custard, then you mix egg yolks and sugar together and then you add cream and heat it up. And it's not the same as if you do the associativity the other way around. As for commutativity, you might think about making mayonnaise, where you really have to start with egg yolks and add the olive oil slowly. If you try starting with the olive oil and adding the egg yolks, it will not form an emulsion and that won't work. And for units, well, if you make a souffle and then do nothing, it's not the same as doing nothing and then making a souffle. For cake, however, it doesn't really matter, it turns out, because the recipe for cake that I know most well says that you start by creaming sugar and butter, then you add eggs, and then you add flour, which I like depicting in a diagram like this because it's a more geometrical approach to the algebra, and we'll see throughout this talk that I really prefer algebra that has geometry embedded in it, which is one of the reasons I love category theory. Anyway, it turns out that especially if you have an electric whisk, you can just kind of throw everything in a bowl and go wah, and it'll more or less be the same. And so maybe I wouldn't call that an equality, maybe I would call it an isomorphism of some kind. And so we could say that maybe this isn't strictly associative, but it is associative up to isomorphism. And this is what the concept of weakness is. It's about equations that don't hold actually exactly precisely, but up to some form of isomorphism or equivalence that we might not think is too troublesome. And the question is, how can we be sure it's not too, too troublesome? And what does that mean rigorously other than, uh, I don't think it really matters. So here's a more mathematical example of weakness, which we might have met before, which is that, uh, oh, also, the clock doesn't seem to be moving. Uh, okay, great, now it's moving. Maybe I just imagined it, or maybe I just got stuck in a time wormhole. Anyway, Cartesian products of sets are usually defined like this, which is that they are a set of ordered pairs, A, B, where A comes from the first set and B comes from the second set. And we write it as A cross B. We might wonder about commutativity. Now, commutativity is B cross A, which is ordered pairs B, A, which is not exceedingly different from ordered pairs A, B, except that we've changed the order of the elements. And so we can also think about associativity. And associativity says if you take A cross B cross C, then you take ordered pairs in A cross B, and then you take ordered pairs of, where the first thing is already an ordered pair, and the second thing is an element of C. Whereas if we do the associativity the other way around, we'll get the ordered pair the other way around, with the second element being the one that's already an ordered pair. But the basic information in those two situations is really not very different. It's still just an A, a B, and a C. It's just we've written the parentheses in different places. And technically, those are not actually the same set because we've moved the parentheses. And then finally, for units, well, we can take the unit in this situation to be a one element set. And if I write the one element of that set as an asterisk, then A cross one is ordered pairs where the first element is an element of A and the second one is the asterisk, always. If I take the, the uh, one cross the A instead, the other way around, then it's going to be the first position that always has the asterisk and the second one has A. And those aren't exactly the same as A. They're not terribly different because they've just got some asterisk stuff on the end. And so we might say, well, they're not extremely different, but they're not really technically the same set. So you might say to yourself, well, who cares? It's a bit pedantic, isn't it? And I'd just like to insert an aside here about what I think pedantry is. I think pedantry is precision without illumination. Whereas if you have precision with more illumination, I don't think that is pedantic. I think that's illuminating. The issue, of course, is that everybody has different things that count as illuminating to them. And to me, something that, like this, might not matter when you're only in this dimension, but I'm going to show you that when you go up dimensions, which is what I do as a category theorist, it does become very important, and it becomes illuminating and not just pedantic, I think. Here is another situation of weakness that you might have met when we're thinking about paths in a space. So 
Usually, in topology, we define a path using the closed unit interval from zero to one, and then we think about a continuous map from that unit interval into the space. And so what that's telling us is that we've parameterized time, and we've said that at time zero, we're at the beginning of this thing, at time one, we're at the end, and at every time between zero and one, we're somewhere in this space. We can try and compose these paths if we have two paths that meet. So that's the end point of P meets the starting point of Q, we can try and turn that into a new path. The trouble is that the most natural thing for this to be parameterized by is an interval of length two, not an interval of length one. So we have to reparameterize it to become an interval of length one, and there is no unique way of doing that. There's a kind of obvious way of doing it, which is to go twice as fast along the first path, and then twice as fast along the second path with this formula which does it, it's not terribly illuminating, I think, but it does do it. And then the point is that this is not associative because if you try and do three of them, if you do this associativity one way round, then you go spend half of your time going along P and only a quarter each on Q and R. Whereas the other way around, you spend a quarter of your time on P and Q and a half of your time on R. And again, it's not extremely different. Maybe it's a bit more different than the situation with Cartesian products of sets, but it's still not terribly different. It's still kind of the same path. You just went along it at different speeds. And so we want ha to have a way of saying that this isn't, this isn't catastrophically different. So there's also some weakness situations in life and some non-associativity that I, I often find. At when I moved to the US from England, I was very baffled by the concept of French silk pie because it didn't seem very French to me. And I eventually learned that it's not trying to be French. It's trying to be like French silk. It's not trying to be a silk pie that is French. A similar sort of cultural misunderstanding happened when I once talked about black cab drivers. Because if you're from London, you know that those are drivers of black cabs, not the associativity the other way around. I once met an epic poet he was a poem, he was a poet of epic poems. He wasn't exactly what I would call an epic poet. But more seriously, I often think about tolerance and intolerance, and whether tolerance of intolerance is the same as intolerance of tolerance. I hope that we all agree that intolerance of tolerance is simply intolerant. But what about if we just tolerate intolerance? If we're trying to be tolerant people, should we be tolerant of intolerance as well? I think that tolerance of intolerance isn't exactly the same as it the other way around, but, oh, that's not what I want to do at all. Cancel that. I think that it is isomorphic, and that if we tolerate intolerance, we are doing something that is in some sense equivalent to being intolerant ourselves. So I'd now like to talk about higher dimensions, and first I have to do some arithmetic to figure out how I'm doing on time. Did it start at 50? Is it counting down from 50 or 60? Anyone? Nobody knows. Okay, so it's not in any way related to, this clock doesn't seem to be related to what I'm supposed to do. Okay, I'll look at my watch instead. Um, I would like to talk about higher dimensions because I love higher dimensions and I don't, I don't just love them sort of randomly. I love them because I think they give us ways to be more nuanced about what we're talking about. And commutativity is actually already a higher dimensional concept, even if we might not think of it like that. But if you've ever tried to explain commutativity to a small child, which I have a lot, and I love doing that because I th find that explaining things to small children requires a very deep understanding and often um, stimulates a very deep understanding because of the innocent but very, very probing questions that small children can ask. And if you try to explain the commutativity of addition to a small child, one way of doing it is to get some counting blocks and you take maybe four of these ones and two of those and then you move them around each other and show that if you move them around each other, it's still the same block, so it should still be the same number. This involves a higher dimension, right? You can only do that by invoking another dimension to get those things around each other. You can also do it by rotating the plate that you've put them on or walking around the table, but in all cases, it requires the invocation of a second dimension. Whereas associativity is not a higher dimensional situation because if you want to show associativity, you can do it with beads on an abacus rail. You just have to move these ones along to the right they don't have to go into any higher dimension. And higher, that, that higher dimensionality is 
actually quite a profound part of higher dimensional category theory. And those dimensions give us more nuance. If we have a yet third dimension, then we can record not just the fact that these things are commutative, but which way around we did the commutativity. So if we move the blue square blocks around the back and we record that path, then we get a braid where the blue crossing goes under the red crossing. But if we move the blue, the blue blocks around the front, then we get a braid with the blue crossing over the red crossing. And those two braids are the basic difference between a French braid and a Swedish braid. The French braid being the one where you bring your hair over from the sides of your head, and that's the one on the left of this picture, and you add more hair and bring the crossing over. Whereas the Swedish braid, you add more hair from the sides and bring the crossings under. And I was fascinated by the difference between these two braids when I was little. And I like to think that I was already doing research in higher dimensional category theory when I stared at other people's braids and tried to figure out how they did the Swedish one, because I only knew how to do the French one. So I'd like to talk about the interconnectedness of those equations now, because they seem like they're about completely different things, but they are interconnected. And so sometimes commutativity can be derived from the other equations. For example, in a ring, we can use distributivity and inverses to derive commutativity. So a ring is a place that has addition and multiplication, and the multiplication distributes over the addition. But if you do this little trick and you think about a plus b times one plus one, then you go, well, there are two ways you can apply distributivity here. You can either count the a plus b as a single object and distribute that over the one plus one first, or you can count the one plus one as a single object and distribute that from the other side over the a plus b, in which case you get that. And if you then proceed with the distributivity on the top one, you get a plus b plus a plus b. And if you do it on the bottom one, you get a plus a plus b plus b. And so that because those have to be the same, what you see is that the a and the b have switched place in the middle. So as long as you have some way of canceling out the a and the b on the ends, then you get the commutativity of addition kind of for free inside a ring. And this is a very, I find it very fascinating that there is this interdependence between the equations. And this is also present in what's called the Edmund Hilton argument, which is a way of showing that higher homotopy groups are commutative. But at root, what you need is two monoid structures. So a monoid is just a set with a multiplication on it, basically. And we need, in addition, that one of them is a homomorphism for the other, which in effect means that they share the same unit and that this slightly different form of distributivity holds. And this looks a bit, it's, I mean, it's algebra in a straight line. I'm not a big fan of manipulating symbols in a straight line. So I like writing it in a slightly higher dimensional way, where I draw the asterisk multiplication horizontally and the circle one vertically, and then it becomes a bit like one of those fortune teller things where you go like this, and then both ways around turn out to be the same. So then what you can deduce using the Ekman Hilton argument is that both of those binary operations actually have to be the same, and moreover, they have to be commutative. So there's actually some small print here, which is you really only need the binary operations to be unital. They don't have to be associative, because you can actually deduce that they're associative as well, and also that they have the same unit. But I stated it in its simplest form. So the idea is that if you look closely at that distributivity equation, it has a B and a C switching over in the middle of it. But then to, so that's the idea, then to effect that as a proof, well, here's a kind of boring algebraic proof. I mean, I think it's boring. Different people find different things boring, right? Maybe you think this is the greatest thing ever, and that's wonderful. So you start with A star B, and then you insert units with respect to circle. Then you perform interchange. You remove the units with respect to star, which is why it's important that they're the same units. You then perform interchange again. Uh, no, you don't. You insert units with respect to asterisk. You then perform interchange again, and then you remove the units. So that's a one-dimensional algebraic proof. I just happen to have written it not in a straight line. Here is a geometric higher dimensional proof, which I prefer, which is the one that you would probably see if you were doing this as the second homotopy group, because homotopies are often depicted by squares. So we start here, and we have these things uh, horizontally uh, multiplied together. Then we insert vertical units, 
we perform interchange, we remove the horizontal units, we put them back in on the other side, we perform interchange again, and we then remove the vertical units. And I've drawn it a bit like a clock because, as I hope you can see, you could continue going around and it would make a whole clock face. I did once make this into a clock. I like it so much that I have also made it into a T-shirt. Here is the Eklund Hilton T-shirt. So now I want to talk about how this relates to category theory, which is my field of research and is the, the map I love the most. So what's the idea of category theory, first of all? Category theory is about structure. And the idea is that we, in math, we often study not just structures in isolation, but particular maps between them. And often it's the maps that are almost more important than the structures themselves. So here are some examples of how we do this. Sometimes we might think about sets and functions between them. We might think about groups and group homomorphisms. And group homomorphisms aren't just any old function. They are functions that respect the structure of the group. So that is an ongoing theme in category theory, where we think about functions that respect structure. So we have rings and ring homomorphisms. We have topological spaces and continuous maps, vector spaces and linear maps, maybe ordered sets and order-preserving functions. But sometimes, individual structures can be seen in a similar light, in a way that is perhaps less obvious. And one of the wonderful things about the abstraction of category theory is that you can apply it in situations that aren't necessarily like structures and maps between them. But if you view a situation in that light, then you can view it in a similar way. For example, here are some things that are sort of structures and sort of maps, but not exactly, maybe. For example, you can take the elements of a set and then identities between them, the like equalities between them as maps. You can take an individual shape and you can regard its symmetries as maps from the shape to itself. You can take the elements of an ordered set and then you can regard the assertions of less than or equal to as maps from one element to another. So in that case, there either is or there isn't a map asserting whether one element is less than or equal to another or not. You can take the points in a topological space and you can take homotopy classes of paths between them. You can't take paths between them because that wouldn't be associative. So the idea of category theory is to study the concept of objects and maps abstractly so that you can develop theories about them abstractly, which you can then apply back into these individual places. You can also then make similarities between different places and use your understanding of one place to increase your understanding of another. So here is what a category is. It's an algebraic structure focusing on maps, which we might also call morphisms. So a category is given by some objects, some morphisms between them, which we often draw as arrows. And then there are also identities. So every object has an identity arrow on it. And there's a concept of composition so that if some things meet in the middle, just like the composition of paths, there is a composite which goes from A to C. There are some axioms, there are units, and there is also associativity. And so if we go back to the examples that we had before, we might have these objects and these maps, and we can, those are more obviously represented as objects and arrows. But then these ones, again, we can draw them in this way, and then we end up drawing the same kinds of diagrams in both situations, even though it's not necessarily so obvious initially to draw, say, an ordered set using um, the objects and arrows in that way, or the, a shape and its symmetries. So the higher dimensional ballet is about the interaction between those things in higher dimensions. So the question is, what does higher dimensions mean in this, the context of category theory? So a category is one dimensional because it's got objects which we consider to be zero dimensional and we have morphisms which we consider to be one dimensional because they're like paths between the objects. Then the question is, why go higher dimensional? And I always like to think that there are two possible motivations for doing something, that there is a kind of, possible of an, possibility of an internal motivation coming from the internal logic of a situation. Then there's also the possibility of an external motivation where you have some goal in mind and you're trying to work towards that goal. And the best situations, I think, are the ones where the internal and the external meet up. And in this situation, that's how I feel about it. 
So the internal motivation is, well, we have decided in category theory that we want to study things via morphisms. So shouldn't we study morphisms in the same way? So we should study morphisms via morphisms between the morphisms. That's an internal motivation. And an external motivation simply is that many mathematical worlds are naturally higher dimensional. And so if we want to study those using category theory in a nuanced way, then we need our category theory to be as higher dimensional as the situations that we're studying. Now, it is hard doing things higher dimensionally. So another approach is to find some way to cut down the dimensions and understand higher dimensional things via some lower dimensional representation of them. And that is another thing that we also do. But here are some reasons not to stop at any point and go all the way higher dimensional. So there's always why do something, and there's also, well, why not do something? So topological spaces and continuous maps between them have a higher dimensional morphism going on, which is the homotopies between those. And there's also the homotopies between those, and then the homotopies between those, and then you know, for forever. Right? So why stop? Well, sometimes you get tired, so you stop and you go, okay, enough, I don't want to do anymore. But if you don't want to stop, that in theory, then it would be fun to go all the way to infinity. Uh, points in a space also have paths between them and homotopies between the paths and homotopies between those. And that is, in fact, the concept, that's where the concept of the fundamental infinity groupoid comes from. There's also a logic situation where you can think about statements and you, think, you can think about proofs as morphisms between statements. And then you can think about proofs that two proofs are equivalent and then proofs that two of those are equivalent and proofs that those are equivalent and so on. And there's also the idea of thinking about totalities of categories. So zero categories, that's, well, zero categories are in fact sets. Those are things without any one-dimensional things. They form a one category when you think about them as a whole. One categories, because they have one more dimension to work with, they actually form a two category, a two-dimensional category. And two-dimensional categories form a three category. So then if you want to study those, three-dimensional Four categories form a four category, and four categories form a five category. So then you sort of have to keep going. Infinity categories form an infinity category. So at that point, you reach a fixed point, and you can stop if you want to. So these are what I call applications. <laughs> so what's a two category? Well, a two category has zero cells, one cells, and two cells. So it has objects and morphisms, and then it has morphisms between the morphisms, which we can think of as two-dimensional. So we often draw them two-dimensional as two-dimensional surfaces in between the one-dimensional paths. And then there are more possibilities for how we compose things, because we've got an extra dimension going on. So there's composition of one cells, which is just like composition of morphisms was. But there are two possible ways to compose two cells, because we can do them in the vertical direction, if they meet at a one cell boundary, but we could also do it in the horizontal direction if they meet at a zero cell boundary. And this is just like there are two ways of composing homotopies if you've met those, also horizontally and vertically. And then there are axioms. So all types of composition satisfy the axioms for a category, so they need to be unital and also associative, plus the horizontal and vertical identities coincide, and also there's an interchange law which you may recognize, and it's again, it's one of these things. It's that if you do horizontal composition and then vertical composition, it's the same as doing vertical composition and then horizontal composition. And what this gives us, that similarity is not an accident, what it gives us is a higher dimensional way of viewing the Ekman Hilton argument. And if we do that, we can look at two categories, and if we kind of, we don't, we only really want to think about the two cells in this situation, not the zero cells and the one cells. So we can think of what is called degenerate situations, where some of the bottom dimensions are trivial. So if you've only got one zero cell in your two category, then effectively what you have is called a monoidal category, which is a category with a multiplication structure on it. And if you only have one zero cell and one one cell, then the only non-trivial dimension is the two-cell dimension. So what effectively what you've got is a set of two cells, and you've got two kinds of operation on it, because you've got horizontal composition and vertical composition. And then you get to do an Ekman-Hilton argument on it and conclude that actually this is a commutative monoid. 
And the Edmund Hilton argument looks exactly like the Edmund Hilton argument did before. You start, you look at your horizontal composition, you perform the Edmund Hilton argument, you show that it's the same as the horizontal, the vertical composition at 12 o'clock, then you move all the way around to three o'clock and you get to a horizontal composition the other way around. So you get to see that your horizontal composition and your vertical composition are the same and also commutative. And so there is this, this interplay between the different compositions and the, uh, the commutativity that we get out of it. So the ballet starts to happen when we think about the difference between strict and weak structures. Because when we have an extra dimension to work with, this is when we can express axioms up to inverse, up to isomorphism. Maybe that should say up to isomorphism. Up to isomorphism rather than just on the nose. And so in a category, there is no more space to express that. So when we're thinking about morphisms, they can only be equal or not. And so associativity and unitality, those are equ equations about morphisms. So they're just true or false. So the, the, those are just equal or not equal. There's nothing in between. Whereas if we have a two category, then the one cells can be isomorphic via invertible two cells. And that means that there is something that's possible in between equal and not equal, and that is isomorphism. And so even if the associativities, the two ways around, aren't actually equal, we can see if they are isomorphic instead. And this is what I mean by higher dimensions giving us more nuance, because there's something in between that we can say other than yes or no. And I always think that this is very valuable in arguments in life as well, because there are way too arguments in the outside world where people are just yelling yes and no at each other, when in fact there are nuances that are possible in between. So a weak two category, also called a bicategory, is like a two category, but the axioms only hold up to specified two cell isomorphisms, which means that instead of the equalities in the equations, there are specified isomorphisms, but then those isomorphisms have to satisfy some new axioms themselves. So we really, there's an amount of complication that starts blowing up. Now we saw for Cartesian products of sets, or we know, or we feel, or we have discovered, or we know in practice, that for, for Cartesian products of sets, it doesn't really matter that those things aren't strictly equal, but they're only associative. And so this is the coherence theorem for two categories, which basically says it doesn't matter, because every weak two category is two equivalent to a strict two category, which means that you can treat it as if it didn't matter. The trouble is that that doesn't work at three dimensions. Or maybe that's a good thing, because otherwise the whole of weak higher dimensional category theory would be completely trivial. So higher dimensional category theory usually means three dimensions and up, which isn't terribly high, is it? But that's where things get separated, because at two dimensions, the weak and the strict aren't really different. And at three dimensions, they are different, and I think very interestingly different. So coherence for three categories says, actually, no, not every weak three category is three equivalent to a strict one. So three equivalence is the next level of equivalence, where you have isomorphism in a one category. In a two category, something weaker is possible, which is called two equivalence. And in a three category, three equivalence is, is possible. Oh, no, I'm talking about the three equivalence of three categories, which is the weakest form of equivalence between those structures. So the obstruction to that situation is exactly the commutativity that I've been talking about. And here's why. Because in a strict situation, all the axioms are equations. And so the Ekman-Hilton argument gives commutativity as an equation. Whereas in a weak situation, all the axioms are isomorphisms. So the Ekman-Hilton argument becomes an isomorphism. And so you end up with an isomorphism instead of a commutativity axiom. And moreover, there are two possible ways of going around that aren't necessarily the same. And the issue is the different braids, the difference between the undercrossing and the overcrossing. Because if you go that way around the Ekman Hilton clock, then you get the crossing where the blue strand is at the back. Whereas if you go this way around the Ekman Hilton clock, you get the crossing where the blue strand is at the front. And if those aren't the same, then you do not have a strict situation anymore. And that is the obstruction to coherence for weak three categories. And so that is what the ballet is, because if you look very closely at how we go around the clock, it, we invoke the following situations. We have vertical units, and if we're in a weak three category, those are only isomorphisms. We also have interchange. 
which is also only an isomorphism. And we have horizontal units, which is also only an isomorphism. And then we do it all again backwards. And so all those things contribute to the weakness of the situation. And coherence says, how weak is a weak N category, actually? And we can study the essence of the weakness by looking at the degenerate situation. So if we look at a doubly degenerate weak three category, that's a three category where we've only got one zero cell and we've only got one one cell, then what we've got left is two cells and three cells. So they form a category. So we've reduced it down to a lower dimensional situation, which is easier to understand. But then we can find traces of the higher dimensional situation in that one dimensional situation. And so what we get is, first of all, we get a monoidal structure, which is the multiplication on that category. But we also get a braiding, which comes from this weak Etman-Hilton argument. And this has been known for quite some time. However, if we do it with a strict three category, we don't get a braided monoidal category. We get a symmetric monoidal category, which is a category with a multiplication which is actually symmetric, which is different from a, a braiding situation. And then the question is, what is there in between? Just like we don't just want to say yes and no to things, there is a possible gray area, which is a terrible category theory joke, because the semi-strict ones were studied by gray, and so they're called gray categories. And anyway, the question is, how, there's a, how weak, how, how strict can you make your weak situation and still maintain weakness? So we've got the totally weak situation producing braided modal category. How strict can we get it while still maintaining all the braidings? And that's the delicate ballet. And the delicate ballet turns out that because it's the interplay between the, all three of these situations, we can tug any one of them. As long as we leave one of them weak, the other ones can be made strict, but we can't make them all strict at the same time. And I find this very interesting because originally, for quite a long time, it was thought that interchange was the thing that produced braidings and that that was what coherence for weak three categories said. And here are the references. That was the Gordon Power Street classical article of 1995 where they proved that every weak tri-category is tri-equivalent to a gray category, which is one where everything is strict apart from interchange. And for quite some time, the received wisdom in the field was that you can make everything strict apart from interchange. But then Carlos Simpson realized that in homotopy theory, interchange is in fact strict, but those situations are not completely strict situations and you still get braidings. And so he conjectured that actually you don't have to make keep interchange weak as long as you keep something else weak. So then Joyal and Koch proved that you can keep your horizontal units weak and make everything else strict. And then finally, I proved with Alex Corner, and this is the preprint we put on the archive last month, that, that there's the other one as well, that you can, leave, you can make everything strict apart from vertical units, and that also enables you to produce all the possible braidings. And I like to think of this as the law of conservation of complicatedness. It's the bump in the carpet that you can't get rid of the bump in the carpet. You can move it around to different places, but there's always going to be a bump somewhere. And that it depends where you want it to be, right? So if you're going to have a party right here, you probably want to put your bump in the carpet over there. But actually, if you're going to have your party over there, you might want to move your bump in the carpet over there. And what's important is knowing how to move the bump so that you can put it in wherever is the most convenient place for you in that moment. There are some subtleties to this situation. Um, so for the, this is more technical now. So the subtlety in the Joel and Koch situation is that it's not a completely doubly degenerate situation. Because it's the horizontal units that are weak, you can't let yourself have only one one cell. Because if you had only one one cell, that unit will automatically be strict. So the subtlety for our situation is that you can't, just have your vertical units be weak, you have to let your associativity be weak as well, because Koch has proved that actually if you have associativity in both directions, you can make an Ekman Hilton argument, it's just a bit more complicated. But it's quite fun, you have a four by four grid, it's like one of those square um, games where you move squares around. As long as you're four by four, you can use associativity to move everything around each other and you get commutativity out. So the 
more technical category theory is how we achieve these structures in the first place. So the Gordon Power street structure, all of, all of these tri-categories are achieved by enrichment, where instead of just having a set of morphisms between objects in a category, you allow that to be some kind of structure in itself. And so what we're doing here is we're allowing the morphisms between objects to form a two category, and that's how you get a three category out. So in the Gordon Power street situation, What's weak is the type of tensor product or the type of functor that they're using. For the horizontal units, it's the type of enrichment that you're using, so that you use a weak enrichment instead of a strict enrichment. And for our situation, it's the thing that we're enriching in in the first place. But the benefit is that we do a completely ordinary one-dimensional enrichment, and we use completely strict functors. It's just that we use weak two categories to do our enrichment. So that is the ballet that I see going on where you can push and pull between your units in the vertical and the horizontal direction and the interchange. And the conclusion is that, first of all, if we have more dimensions, then we get more nuance. We can express more nuance, which I think is important if we're studying subtle mathematical objects, but it's also a moral that I like to take with me in life as well, that instead of having arguments about whether things are right or wrong, we can be more nuanced about it and talk about some senses in which some things are right and some senses in which some other things are right. And so that's what the second point is, I just realized, that we can say in what sense axioms hold rather than just saying that they do or they don't. And that commutativity measures something very fundamental about higher dimensions. So when we think about those basic axioms that we teach to small children, I hope we'll remember that they're not that basic after all, and if small children are confused by them, maybe there's something profound going on in their heads, actually. I like to think that there's always something profound going on in the heads of small children. And that there is a delicate balance of strictness and weakness in higher dimensions. And this is at the heart of why I find higher dimensional category theory interesting, but also why it's hard, because that balance is so delicate. So thank you very much. Uh, I just want to finish here are some more things that I'm doing this week. And if you want to hear more category theory, there's a whole applied category theory session going on tomorrow. Thank you very much. Now, because there's time, I would like to do what I call congressive question time, where instead of people having to put themselves forward and stand at a microphone and give their question in front of the whole audience, especially because this is officially a talk for students. I would like to encourage students to ask questions and also people who are usually too shy to ask questions in public. So instead of asking you to come to the microphone, I'd like to spend five or 10 minutes just walking around and seeing what questions you have, especially if you, you're usually too shy to ask a question or you've never asked a question before, and especially if you're a student. And once I've gathered all the questions by coming around and talking to you, I'll come back to the front and address the questions so that everybody can hear the benefit of those questions without you having to put yourself out there and dare to ask a question. So when I give public talks, I also like, I'm sure this wouldn't happen here, but I also like doing that because it stops people from pontificating and yelling at me. So if we could perhaps just mute my microphone for a second. Okay, great. I'll come around to the about what you would like to discuss. Hello, 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 wonderful, thank you. So sorry I didn't get to the very end of the room, but the, there's only a certain amount of time, and I'm happy to talk to you some more afterwards if you would like to. Um, so one question someone asked is, where can you learn more category theory? Which is a great question, because I just wrote a book to help people learn more category theory. <laughs> and that's the one I, that's the joy of abstraction, and I'll be at the CUP stall in the reception this evening, signing that, so you can buy it there and I'll sign it for you if you like. Um, so I wasn't sure if I was allowed to say that, but since someone asked, I think that I'm allowed to say that. Um, someone said, the bumps in the carpet reminded them of uh, genus in topology and how you, you classify things according to genus and you can't get rid of a hole when you're classifying things. And is it similar or is it, in this case, you already know where the hole is? And so it's sort of more like you, you want to know how much you can, it's similar because it's sort of how much you can adjust your structure while maintaining that bump in the carpet. And category theory did grow out of topology and homotopy theory, and so there is definitely some deep relations going on there. So a couple of people, someone was interested 
coming more from a computer science point of view, saying that maybe Cartesian products really don't feel the same when you're doing computer science. And that's one of the reasons that computer science is very related to category theory and also very related to higher dimensional category theory, in fact. Um, somebody said, could I do the interchange thing again a bit more slowly? So the answer to that is yes. Um, so maybe I'll do this one here. So you start with horizontal composition. And then what you do is you insert a vertical unit, one on each side. And so because you insert them in different directions, on the left-hand side, you put the vertical unit on the bottom. And on the right-hand side, you put it on top. So then you've got a horizontal composite of some vertical composites. And interchange says that you can switch that around so that it's now a vertical composite of horizontal composites. And now you can do those units, you can get rid of them horizontally instead of vertically. And so you can now use the horizontal unit constraints to get rid of those, and now you've just got a vertical composite of T cells. And now you do the whole thing again, but the other way around. So you now insert horizontal units the on the other side, so now you've got a vertical composition of horizontal composites. And now you can do interchange again. So the interchange says that you can convert that into a horizontal composite of vertical composites. And now you can use those units as vertical units instead. And so you can get rid of them. And now it goes back to just being a horizontal composite. So I hope that that uh, makes a little bit more sense. It all hinges on the fact that those units can act as units both vertically and horizontally. And the horizontal and the vertical directions come from the fact that two cells in a two category have, they go between one dimensional cells. And so you can compose them via the one dimensional boundary, or you can compose them along the zero dimensional boundary. Um, somebody asked why, why the homotopies really go infinite dimensional, isn't it just like having a set. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understood that question now that I think about it. But the idea is that you have, you have um, spaces, and then you have continuous maps between them. And one of the very brilliant things about homotopy theory is that a homotopy can be thought of as a map between continuous maps, even though it's expressed as just a continuous map in its own right, which is why you just instantly get infinite dimensions, because you can iterate that process instantly without having to make new definitions. And so just using the definition of a continuous map, you get the homotopies, and you get the homotopies between those and the homotopies between those. Because a continuous map goes from a space to a space, but then a homotopy from between maps from x to y. So you have two spaces, x and y, and you have continuous maps from x to y. Then a homotopy goes from x cross i to y. So it's really just a continuous map. But because you have made, you've, you've made a cylinder, so i is the unit interval. So when you take x cross i, you essentially make a cylinder on your space. And because you've made that space go up a dimension, you can kind of perform some mental gymnastics and instead regard, regard it as your map having gone higher dimensional rather than your space having gone higher dimensional. So that's something that is pretty clever. Um, someone said, does it get more and more complicated in dimension four? The answer is yes, because there is more space for things to move in different directions. And so it's very much, because this is related to spaces, we can think of it as actual physical space. And in physical space, if you think about two particles moving, they can cross over each other. And if you then take very seriously their paths, they have traced in this space a crossing. And in three-dimensional space, this overcrossing is really different from this overcrossing. You can't get those braids past each other, right? My arms can't move past each other like this. But in four dimensions, they can. In four dimensions, I can invoke the fourth dimension to get my arm past my other arm. I just pop into the fourth dimension briefly and then pop out on the other side. And so in the fourth dimension, the overcrossing and the undercrossing can be turned into each other. But just like in the third dimension, there are two ways to make a braid. There are two ways to make the undercrossing turn into the overcrossing, depending on whether you kind of go into the fourth dimension that way or you go into the fourth dimension that way. And that move is called a selepsis. And so what you get is the possibility of selectic monoidal two categories. So in a two category, you can have monoidal two categories, um, selectic monoidal two categories, braided monoidal two categories, and symmetric monoidal two categories. So with every dimension you get, there's, another, there's one more stage of nuance you can get in between not being symmetric at all and being entirely symmetric. 
Someone said, in higher dimension, higher and higher dimensions, how does the human brain deal with that? And how do you cope with it? And I think the point is that everything is very complicated until you get better at it. And if you spend enough time dealing with something, it becomes straightforward. Everybody in their field gets used to something. And then once you're used to it, your brain can then do something else. And one of the things I love about abstract mathematics is the way that we package things up into units so that instead of having tons of stuff, we, we turn it back into one thing. And when I'm giving public talks, I often say this is like those vacuum bags where you put all your clothes in a plastic bag and then you suck all the air out with a vacuum cleaner and then it becomes really small and then it's easier to carry around. And so I think what category theory and abstract math does is it packages things up via the connections so that this thing that was loads of stuff becomes one thing. And now your brain can deal with it better because that load of stuff is one thing and this load of stuff is one thing. And then you can package those things up and that load of stuff becomes one thing. And you gradually build up so that things that originally seemed really complicated get to seeming much more straightforward. Um, how do you prove that morphisms are the same and that it's possible to have two different morphisms between the same things? Yes, and you prove that morphisms are the same, somewhat in the same way that you prove anything is the same. It's just that often in category theory, because they are morphisms, you can draw diagrams and invoke your geometric intuition to show that they're the same rather than just having to write strings of symbols. And you can definitely have two different morphisms between the two same two things. For example, if you have two sets, there are loads of possible functions between them, right? There's p to the power of n, where p is something and n is something else, functions between two sets. Um, so yes, you definitely can. Uh, are there different infinite kernels of infinity categories? Amazing question. Perhaps you can make that definition. That can be the new infinite dimensional. We haven't even really sorted out the first, car the first infinity of infinity categories, so um, we, have a long, we have a long way to go. Um, so, let's see. Someone said, the move into higher dimensions feels a bit like the move from reals to complex numbers to quaternions and so on. Is it similar? Kind of yes, because those involve adding higher dimensions. It's just more abstract because we're not doing specific higher dimensions. It's just the general possibility of higher dimensions. Um, an example of a set with two operations satisfying the Etten Hilton argument. Well, it all came out of higher homotopy groups. And so if you look at the second homotopy group, then it has two operations on it, one being the vertical uh, composition and one being the horizontal. And that's how you get, that's how you get something satisfying those two two things, or any two categories, so the, any doubly degenerate two category. But then, it, so it turns out that they're all commutative monoids. And so any commutative monoid is a set with two operations on it satisfying that. Um, and uh, I think I said more about degeneracy, and perhaps there's just time for me to say one last thing. S some people were thanked me, which is really nice. Thank you for thanking me. Um, and someone said, where do I come up with the ideas for explaining all of these things. And the answer is, I've spent all my life enjoying explaining math to other people. Because there have often been times when I've understood math more than the people around me, either when I was in middle school or elementary school, or just in grad school, socializing with people from different subjects, which I think is really important because you get a lot of inspiration and new ideas from talking to people in completely different subjects, like art history. And so, um, it's much easier for an art historian maybe to explain their research to other people. But I always wanted to try to explain my research to my friends. And so I did at parties. And doing it for years, together with teaching, which puts pressure on you to find different ways to explain things to people who don't understand it yet. Gradually, I just built up more and more ways to explain things. And when you're talking to someone in real time at a party, you can see what interests them and what doesn't. So if they're not interested, you quickly start doing that and talk about something else. And you gradually get to find out the things that will click with people. And so that is how I come up with ways of explaining things. And so I would encourage you, if you think it's important to explain math to other people, which I hope you do, because it is, that you start by trying explaining it to your friends. Don't think, oh, I'm a mathematician. I can't talk about my research with my friends or my mom or something. You can, just try, find ways to talk about it, and then you, you too will develop ways to explain math to other people. Thank you very much.